FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is February 21st, 2017. So Trump's tax plan is due out imminently. I was just informed by the lovely Danielle Park. And well, we don't know yet what's going to be in it. Certainly the tax system is well due for a major overhaul. It's manifestly unfair. Whether there should be a corporate tax or not. Well, we could have that debate for another day, but the corporate tax in its current incarnation, we're looking at, well, for the little people, the little companies, for the small businesses, it's upwards of 40%. Or the the blessed, the uh, privileged few, for the GEs, or the Apples, for the Alphabet Google people, it's whatever they feel like paying because they have high rises full of attorneys and accountants. GE hasn't paid corporate income tax in a meaningful way. It's probably since you and I, Danielle, uh, have been alive. And by the way, Danielle, welcome back as always. Always great to have you on the show. And uh, hey, lots to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a few things. I was just writing our uh February uh, letter to our clients in the last weekend. And um, it's really on the evolution of corporations and the way in which corporate capture has worked on legislative bodies over the past couple couple of decades, really, um, and has not not likely to get better under Trump, frankly, because the same same sort of forces are at work. Um, And it's the it's the notion and it's it's an erroneous notion that the large uh, largest corporations uh, add all this incredible benefit to society and make all these jobs when in fact it's the small businesses that actually uh, are the main driver of job growth and um, so you know anything that can help with uh, small businesses to um, you know get more robust to increase uh, customers they don't need more loans by the way um, they're the latest uh, you know small business federation confirmed that only four percent of small business owners or medium business owners said that they had a problem borrowing money that's not the issue issue. And what they say they want is more customers. And, you know, so that's really, that's really the truth of the matter. And they do drive the economy and make most of the jobs. And they do have an ability to source locally, to be, you know, uh, to hire locally. I mean, this is really where the focus of any kind of stimulative tax uh, program should focus first. What it shouldn't do is placate and curtail them uh, more towards the um, the multinational corporations because they've really had a hell of a go. Uh, the past 20 years, it's been increasingly all mm-hmm. about them, all in service to them. Everyone held hostage to this, you know, promise of, of economic uh, opportunity, which really has been um, held off and kept to a very small group of people and not shared liberally with the workforce, not uh, shared in terms of CAC tax revenues, the governments. Um, They really have commanded all the resources, broke all the rules, got away with all the money, and everyone's left with IOUs and deficits. So, you know, I think what we should expect in this next period, there's a couple of no-brainer things that would take like two paragraphs of legislation. One of them would be to ban this buyback of of corporate shares. You know, in the 80s, that was considered um, market manipulation, and it should be. It is. If you look at the trillions of dollars that corporations have bought their own shares with and borrowed money to do so. So that's the tax policy, you know, working in their favor there, where they're allowed to borrow money, tax deduct the interest, buy back their own shares, drive up the prices so that they can compensate executives and the controlling shareholders, you know, but ultimately not uh, beneficial, no compounding effect in terms of compound growth for the economy as a whole and no tax revenues properly uh, collected there. So the best thing that progressive tax policies or Trump and companies and you want to actually do stimulative actions is to do something really simple like end that. That would be huge. And then the next thing I think that we have to all expect, frankly, is we've had, as I said, this period where the shareholders and corporations have had it all their way. 
Um, and what we must now realize is that's where the money is. So follow the money, right? So we should expect, frankly, I'm not, I'm not happy to say this because, you know, I'm a landowner, I'm an asset owner, but the fact of the matter is that there's deficits, there's debt, there's not enough cash flow, and there's declining revenues. And if if the new government in the U.S. gets its protectionist measures in place, I think we can expect that there'll be more declining revenue, at least for the next, you know, for the short term, maybe longer term, it would be restorative and regenerative for the economy. I'm not actually saying that's such a bad idea, but I think short term, we have to expect that they'll be taking a hit. And so that means they're going to have to look for revenue and they're going to look for it where the, where the, cash flow or the wealth is. And I think that's the difference. The last 20 years has been allowed to, wealth's been allowed to build up in a few spots, largely enabled by uh, tax policy and, and regulation forbearance in those areas. That's where we should expect to see the mean reversion happen now. And that's why people talk about, you know, what's going to happen to the economy. Of course, my focus is more about what's going to happen to asset markets. And they are not the same thing. Just as we know that in the recovery since 2009, the, the asset markets have done phenomenally well, but the real economy has not. Right. So I think in this new phase, the theme may well be, you know, falling um, a period of decline while we try and recalibrate some of these um, policies that have been destructive. And that means you're likely to see a downturn in GDP. You're likely to see a fall down in revenue. Job uh, losses are likely to spike again for a while because you're already at basically max uh, uh, employment in the United States. Um, But then you know, a- after this give back period, this will probably help to rebuild for the next sort of expansion. But first of all, you have to give back. And I find that most people are talking about, you know, all this hope for stimulus, but nobody realizes the mean reversion that has to happen in these areas that have unduly benefited from the policies of the past, you know, at least decade. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, I don't know that we're at full employment in the U.S. because the statistics, they've all been cooked. I mean, the U1 unemployment says 4.7%, I think it said last time, 4.9, and nothing could be further from the truth. You know that. I understand, but I'm (laughs) saying that the the employable populace in your country is is stick well the fed's target is typically you know unemployment rate below 5 at 5% five has always been considered full employment and you're below that so i agree there's a lot of people not counted out of the workforce who've given up and all that mm-hmm. but i'm saying the jobs that are available in your economy today have largely been filled already by the workers that are available and there's a mismatch of need with skills there's a mismatch, you know, of there's a disproportionate number of poor paying jobs and part time jobs filling that void. Um, so I'm not saying employment's great or robust or anything, but I'm just saying yeah. cyclically, cyclically, you know, we're in the third longest expansion since in 150 years. Trump comes into power, it would be much more likely to see a recession in his first term than not. I mean, because, you know, the people that assume that we can avoid the downturn, avoid the recessions, avoid any bear markets are always the same people. You know, they just stick their head in the sand and pretend that cycles aren't actually in charge. And they live in a dream world where none of that has to mean revert. And I I think it's a very bad strategy. It's very, um, it's very, uh, you know, willfully blind. And what happens is that maybe, you know, it works out for a while, but then you get like catastrophic (laughs) wipeouts because no one is is waiting for it to come. So, you know, and the other thing is they're talking about the Trump admin plans to cut taxes and everything. But in reality, your tax revenues in the U.S. have already been falling um, since they peaked in 2012. It's been negative over the last year. So again, typically that's an indication of recession already underway. So again, you know, they may try if they're going to cut taxes now, but not increase revenue. Uh, or not reduce spending when you're at 20 trillion in debt, as you well know, Carrie. There's there's something wrong with this. Like there's, it's not going to be the cure all, fix all, magical solution that anyone's hoping for. Yeah, highly unlikely. Uh, <laughs> you know, obviously we we need some major spending cuts. It's not like all that money is being spent wisely by any stretch. I mean, easily half the defense budget is wasted on nonsense. I mean, we know this. We've seen it over and over again. One of the few encouraging signs of uh, Trump is 
he's going after these defense contractors and other contractors. When you're a, a government contractor, it's often been a license to steal. I'm not saying every one of them uh, rips off the country, the government, but many of them steal from the government, from the people. I mean, it's so poorly supervised and so lax, uh, the world of government contracting. And I'm sure it's no different in your country, in any other country. This is just the way it works. It always mm -hmm. has. Uh, they put through like, these change orders and they just rip us off. Well, you know, it's it's really interesting. I put a, a TED talk on this morning of um, the uh, the author of uh, Sapien. I don't know if you've read that book. Um, hard to pronounce his name. Yuval Noah Harari. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, he's done this very uh, extensive uh, historical research on the evolution of the human species. And he talks about our... Uh, accountability deficit. So, and this is something that I've touched on before is mm -hmm. my, my belief is that humans are at their most accountable and uh, best, frankly, in relatively small pods or communities. So, you know, oh, yeah. you can be accountable to your family members, to your neighbors, maybe to the people you work with in a, in a small sort of grouping. But once you get into this uh, sort of two and three degrees removed of actual <coughs> personal contact, it's mm -hmm. much easier for people to not think of uh, the victims or the harm they're doing to people that are not within their immediate circle. And this is the problem with these big multinational and global, you know, uh, concepts and institutions. It's very easy for people to then become willfully blind to how they may be unduly benefiting and others being ripped off, for example. Um, and you see that certainly in government. Anyway, oh, in, yeah. in this talk, he says that in, in their studies, past 150 people, they notice a dramatic decline in accountability to one another and therefore much more likelihood of um, cheating the system or stealing from the system or, sure. you know, um, taking unfairly when when you're beyond 150 people. It's like the human animal can't be accountable to more than that number uh, without starting to make mental judgments or you know, play games about why that's not really what they're doing kind of thing. I think that's the problem with big government um, and other people's money. Of course, it's it's always, again, much easier to spend, much easier to waste. Um, and, uh, you know, that goes for left or right policies. It really, you know, anyone that wants unlimited spending by the government for anything is really has lost that perspective and that sense of balance. And I think, you know, the, the separation of powers, the need for corporate interests to be contained, um, the need for personal accountability within corporations and without uh, is the only things that can keep our system somewhat honest. And that's where we have to be so careful with these, uh, you know, again, just huge governments is a problem, huge institutions, huge pensions. You know, um, if you're putting a bunch of if you if you're running a, a small pool of assets and it's it's uh, people putting in their savings monthly and you know how many people and you know how much it needs to pay out at what age they hope to retire what income you know the correct approach is to look at that every year and say okay we have to increase contributions because here's the formula here's the math you know but the more you get to these huge pensions that are, again, run by people who don't personally know the people whose savings is in the pot. And, you know, all of a sudden uh, addressing boards of directors, again, it's not necessarily their money and all that. You get into all sorts of problems. And that's that's exactly what what's happened. You know, you guys are not the only ones that have a completely disastrous entitlement system down there. I mean, that's where the bulk of the government rep, um, um rejigging and cuts and extra funding. That's where that most of it is in your entitlement program. And you know that in Canada too, the Canadian pension plan is where the majority of more than 60% of Canadians are going to be dependent in retirement. Yeah. And instead of actually funding it correctly and managing it correctly, we hire these people who promise they're <laughs> going to make outsized gains and make the math yeah. all magically work. And of course, when it doesn't work out, then okay, maybe you fire that guy and you get in someone else. But the problem never gets fixed. And yet it is a fixable problem. That's actually a finite mathematical equation that we could figure out. Mm -hmm. But no one 
one actually wants to do the constant, you know, funding, maintenance, reality check, head out of the sand, looking at the numbers part. Instead, we hired a Goldman Sachs dude just recently um, Mm -hmm. to come in and and he says, oh, yeah, I don't understand why you wouldn't take a lot more risk with your pension plan. You know, that's his big idea. No surprise there. Total sense. Uh, (laughs) Hey, it's like the gambler's paradox, you know, that somehow if you keep doubling down, after losing, eventually you're going to hit it big, but uh, it doesn't work that way. And it's just like California's problem with that big dam that looked like it was going to collapse last week, and we're still not out of the woods on, right? We're still yeah. not out of the woods on it. Uh, it could easily collapse this week or be severely impaired, and 50% of uh, Los Angeles's water comes from that dam. It's so simple, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. We know that. And yet it doesn't get done. Same we thing. manage by crisis, right? So I guess they need to have it collapse in crisis and deficit of water that can't be ignored. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, then they'll swoop in and, and try and actually fix the problem or, or just patch it up and kick the can a while longer. But I just fi- uh, finished, I may have mentioned it before, but it is one of the best books I've read in a long time. It's Michael Lewis's new book, The Undoing yep, Project. I read it. Yes. Yeah. Isn't it? So what I took from that is really, you know, first of all, that body of work that Kahneman and Traversky, Traversky did, you know, in the, uh, mm-hmm. in the eighties, nineties, um, it is just so it, 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 it's a broad swath. It cuts through all academic yes. disciplines and, and, professions and it really shows how horrible humans are at assessing probability at you know risk management yeah. um, how we go on intuition so it and really the message, <laughs> we're always it, wrong on it too that's what's it, really wild and yet in real life we still have to keep making these judgments it's not as though we can say oh we're terrible at making assessments therefore i'll make none good luck with that yeah. you know we still need professionals trying to save lives or fix teeth or or engineers building bridges we still need to build or people managing risk and There's money we no still substitute. need something right but but uh it's it's inherently flawed so the best way to approach it is with incredible humility and and rules around your your weakness and infallibility and um and accountability and keeping your head down so to speak so that you're not you know get get lost in the land of ego and all this stuff so anyway i think you know it's just a very useful thing Mm -hmm. i think the worst thing people can do is start talking about how smart they are and frankly that's one of the things that upsets me about your new president is talking about the IQs of his cabinets. That to me is like, oh dear, you don't really believe they're geniuses, do you? Because then we're in real trouble. And that's one thing we've learned is that when you approach something thinking you're a genius, you've already screwed up. You know, it's like your men are already dead, as they say in in the Matrix, you know, when Trinity goes up and he's like, oh, it's just a, just a young, oh really? Well, your men are already dead because (laughs) you've been busy thinking how, how genius you are. Yeah. Yeah. The hubris will get you every time. And that is the way it works. I mean, there's no question. It always happens that way. (laughs) Yeah. And just like the media that said that uh, Hillary Clinton uh, is president now. Right. Mm -hmm, And the last I checked, she's not. You, what's that Alexander Hamilton said? We must never let the wish become father the, the thought. The father the thought. The right? Wish should not father the thought. Right, and and it goes for the same people who insist that change isn't possible. As you and I were just chatting before the the, the call, you know, people mm-hmm. will say, "Well, change isn't possible," and I always think, "Wow, it must be nice to let yourself off the hook so easily. Go back to having a beer." Because the rest of the world is really trying to evolve, stumbling and starting and making all these mistakes every day. We still have to push this puck up the ice. And um, and I, I believe we will. But I think, as I said at the beginning, to think we don't have to give back, to think that profits that have been unduly inflated by the policies of the past 10 years don't have to mean revert, that share and asset prices that have been so unduly overvalued through all this don't have to come down, you know, the people that are banking on keeping these levels and just how do we get policies to continue from here are missing the point. You know, the pendulum swings back, we restore some equilibrium again, and we restart. 
And I think that that's, that's, that's going to be a messy process. But as I say, highly likely to happen in the next four years, maybe already underway and started. Um, and whether or not Mr. Trump gets a second term may well have a lot to do with the timing of of how quickly that process completes, you know, is it a, is it a sh- sharp shot? Is it a sharp decline in in assets and GDP and everything, and then you know, sort of a, a a decent recovery thereafter, or is it a secular bottom where everything declines and really flounders for a few years <laughs> as excesses are worked out of the system? And if that's the case, it's going to be a haul. It's going to be a haul for people that are over debted, for corporations yeah. that are over indebted. But it is a cleaning process, and that ultimately is historically what's needed yeah well i'm always skeptical of any uh, f- quick fixes this took us uh, you know 100 years to get into this mess a couple of many wars you know because a lot of the debt was run up during these wars and there's no quick fixes to it and it requires a lot of re-engineering of expectations beliefs and and the way we do things so, well, you know, e- this egotistical overconfidence is directly connected to debt. There's no question about it. If you were required, if most people are required to live and spend in accordance with their actual cash flow and actual uh savings, you would see an incredibly reduced um, standard of living apparent in the housing, the cars, the, you know, yeah. the, the clothing, everything. And the problem is that that entitlement that comes without actually having to amass the savings or pay for things cash is off, often the same sense of entitlement that wants to keep pumping debt to keep this system afloat. And mm-hmm. again, you go back to personal discipline and accountability, yep. that tends to be Absolutely. without debt. And once you take, you're like, deflating the ego out of the system and everyone kind of goes back to a more uh you know humble uh honest um spending pattern in account in accordance with what they can actually afford so i think that that ultimately is is essential because we've been through this Mm -hmm. period where debt has allowed to destroy all of that sort of logic and and rational balance yeah absolutely and um well, I think we'll leave it at that for this week. But uh, next week or uh, two weeks, I want to talk about big data and the insights that it's giving us into human behavior, Danielle. Because a lot of what you're talking about, you know, a lot of it's intuitive. We know it. But big data is really giving us insights into our behavior that we never had before in all facets of human experience, from law enforcement to economics to online behavior. I mean, just amazing things that we're learning about the human species that we never understood before. I mean, it's also being used for ill gains as well, but uh, we should have a discussion about big data and how it really, really can uh, show us the way in so many of these areas that we've neglected and been ignorant of. Uh, I agree. It's fabulous. Yeah, no, for sure. Really has. So hey, we'll leave it at that. Check out Danielle's site, Must Reading, in so many different areas, especially her commentaries, jugglingdynamite.com. We've got the link to it in the show notes on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for the newsletter, Danielle. Oh, and my new book is out, uh, Viral Podcasting. If you have any interest in podcasting or online radio, kind of tell you how I did it and uh, through the story, how maybe you can do it too. That's it. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks, Danielle. Be well. All right. Thanks, Gary. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. erroneous notion that the large uh, largest corporations uh, add all this incredible benefit to society and make all these jobs when in fact it's the small businesses that actually uh, are the main driver of job growth and um, so you know anything that can help with uh, small businesses to um, you know get more robust to increase uh, customers they don't need more loans by the way um, they're the latest uh, you know small business federation confirmed that only 
only 4% of small business owners or medium business owners said that they had a problem borrowing money. That's not the issue. And what they say they want is more customers. And, you know, so that's really, that's really the truth of the matter. And they do drive the economy and make most of the jobs. And they do have an ability to source locally, to be, you know, uh, to hire locally. I mean, this is really where the focus of any kind of stimulative tax uh, program should focus first. What it shouldn't do is placate and curtail them uh, more towards the um, the multinational corporations because they've really had a hell of a go. Uh, the past 20 years, it's been increasingly all mm-hmm. about them, all in service to them. Everyone held hostage to this, you know, promise of, of economic uh, opportunity, which really has been um, held off and kept to a very small group of people and not shared liberally with the workforce, not uh, shared in terms of CAC tax revenue the governments. Um, they really have commanded all the resources, broke all the rules, got away with all the money, and everyone's left with IOUs and deficits. So, you know, I think what we should expect in this next period, there's a couple of no-brainer things that would take like two paragraphs of legislation. One of them would be to ban this buyback of, of corporate shares. You know, in the 80s, that was considered um, market manipulation, and it should be. It is. If you look at the trillions of dollars that corporations have bought their own shares with and borrowed money to do so. So that's the tax policy, you know, working in their favor there, where they're allowed to borrow money, tax deduct the interest, buy back their own shares, drive up the prices so that they can compensate executives and the controlling shareholders, you know, but ultimately not uh, beneficial, no compounding effect in terms of compound growth for the economy as a whole and no tax revenues properly uh, collected there. So the best thing that progressive tax policies or if Trump and companies company want to actually do stimulative actions is to do something really simple like end that. That would be huge. And then yeah. the next thing I think that we have to all expect, frankly, is we've had, as I said, this period where the shareholders and corporations have had it all their way. Um, and what we must now realize is that's where the money is. So follow the money, right? So we should expect, frankly, I'm not I'm not happy to say this because, you know, I'm a landowner, I'm an asset owner, but the fact of the matter is that there's deficits, there's debt, there's not enough cash flow, and there's declining revenues. And if if the new government in the U.S. gets its protectionist measures in place, I think we can expect that there'll be more declining revenue, at least for the next, you know, for the short term, maybe longer term, it would be restorative and regenerative for the economy. I'm not actually saying that's such a bad idea, but I think short term, we have to expect that they'll be taking a hit. And so that means they're going to have to look for revenue and they're going to look for it where the, where the, cash flow or the wealth is. And I think that's the difference. The last 20 years has been allowed to, wealth's been allowed to build up in a few spots, largely enabled by uh, tax policy and, and regulation forbearance in those areas, that's where we should expect to see the mean reversion happen now. And that's why people talk about, you know, what's going to happen to the economy. Of course, my focus is more about what's going to happen to FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is February 21st, 2017. So Trump's tax plan is due out imminently. I was just informed by the lovely Danielle Park. And well, we don't know yet what's going to be in it. Certainly the tax system is well due for a major overhaul. It's manifestly unfair. Whether there should be a corporate tax or not. Well, we could have that debate for another day, but the corporate tax in its current incarnation, we're looking at, well, for the little people, the little companies, for the small businesses, it's upwards of 40%. Or the the blessed, the uh, privileged few, or the GEs, or the Apples, for the Alphabet Google people, it's whatever they feel like paying because they have high rises full of attorneys and accountants. GE hasn't paid corporate income tax in a meaningful way. It's probably since 
you and I, Danielle, uh, have been alive. And by the way, Danielle, welcome back as always. Always great to have you on the show and uh, hey, lots to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a few things. I was just writing our uh, February uh, letter to our clients in the last weekend, and um, it's really on the evolution of corporations and the way in which corporate capture has worked on legislative bodies over the past couple couple of decades, really, um, and has not not likely to get better under Trump, frankly, because the same same sort of yeah. forces are at work. Um, and it's the it's the notion, and it's it's an asset markets, and they are not the same thing. Just as we know that in the recovery since two thousand and nine, the the asset Asset markets have done phenomenally well, but the real economy has not. Right. So I think in this mm -hmm. new phase, the theme may well be, you know, falling um, a, a period of decline while we try and recalibrate some of these um, policies that have been destructive. And that means you're likely to see a downturn in GDP. You're likely to see a fall down in revenue. Job uh, losses are likely to spike again for a while because you're already at basically max uh, uh, employment in the United States. Um, but then you know, a after this give back period, this will probably help to rebuild for the next sort of expansion. But first of all, you have to give back. And I find that most people are talking about, you know, all this hope for stimulus, but nobody realizes the mean reversion that has to happen in these areas that have unduly benefited from the policies of the past, you know, at least decade. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know that we're at full employment in the U.S. because the statistics, they've all been cooked. I mean, the U1 of unemployment course. says 4.7%, I think it said last time, 49 right. and nothing could be further from the truth. You know no, that. I understand, but I'm <laughs> yeah. saying that the, the employable populace in your country is, is stick. Well, the Fed's target is typically, you know, unemployment rate below five at five percent has always been considered full employment. And you're below that. So I agree. There's a lot of people not counted out of the workforce who've given up and all that. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying the jobs that are available in your economy today have largely been filled already by the workers that are available. And there's a mismatch of need with skills. There's a mismatch, you know, of there's a disproportionate number of poor paying jobs and part time jobs filling that void. Um, so I'm not saying employment's great or robust or anything, but I'm just saying yeah. cyclically, cyclically, you know, we're in the third longest expansion since in 150 years. Trump comes into power. It would be much more likely to see a recession in his first term than not. I mean, because, you know, the people that assume that we can avoid the downturn, avoid the recessions, avoid any bear markets are always the same people. You know, they just stick their head in the sand and pretend that cycles aren't actually in charge. And they live in a dream world where none of that has to mean revert. And I, I think it's a very bad strategy. It's very, um, it's very, uh, you know, willfully blind. And what happens is that maybe, you know, it works out for a while, but then you get like catastrophic <laughs> wipeouts and because no one is, is waiting for it to come. So, you know, and the other thing sure. is they're talking about the Trump admin plans to cut taxes and everything. But in reality, your tax revenues in the U.S. have already been falling um, since they peaked in 2012. It's been negative over the last year. So again, typically that's an indication of recession already underway. So again, you know, they may try if they're going to cut taxes now, but not increase revenue uh, or not reduce spending. When you're at 20 trillion in debt, as you well know, Carrie, there's there's something wrong with this. Like there's it's not going to be the cure all fix all magical solution that anyone's hoping for. Yeah, highly unlikely. Uh, you know, obviously, we we need some major spending cuts. It's not like all that money is being spent wisely by any stretch. I mean, easily half the defense budget is wasted on nonsense. I mean, we know this. We've seen it over and over again. One of the few encouraging signs of uh, Trump is he's going after these defense contractors and other contractors. When you're a government contractor, it's often been a licensed